interview with David Cooper, the police chief of the city of Madison. And uh, it's taking place on January 29th, 1990, in my home. I'm Ruth Doyle. I am doing this for the Historic Madison Incorporated, which has an oral history project uh, containing tape recordings of the many interesting people in the city of Madison. Now, uh, Mr. Cooper, can you tell us where did you come from, from Madison, before you came to Madison? Well, I was at, uh, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, in a suburb called uh, Burnsville, Minnesota. And I was there for about four years as the uh, chief of police there. And then prior to that, I was with the Minneapolis Police Department for uh, about seven years before that. So you were a man of many, lots of experience. <laughs> Try to be. <laughs> and uh, what, what about your educational background? Well, let's see, 19, let's see, I came here in 1972. In uh, 1968, I finished up my bachelor's degree in 1970. had gotten my master's degree from the University of Minnesota in uh, sociology, uh, deviant behavior. And uh, I did that all the time. I was, I was working full time uh, while going to school. It was a kind of a tough job. I wouldn't want to uh, advise that uh, to anybody else. Well, restless people have to do it that way. Could Emotionally, be. they can't. It could be. They, they feel idle. Or <laughs> Let me just stop for a second. I always uh, thought it would be nice if the Russians were coming to have the police chief at the gates of the city able to talk to them in their own language. That's but right. Now, now it's different, of course. They, they have to go over there yeah, to teach yeah. them how to be policemen. That's right. They're Interesting. These are interesting times we live in. They sure are. All oh, that in just Eastern Europe. The Berlin Wall. I thought not in my lifetime. No, nobody ever. And then just winds of change without, without a lot of bloodshed. I mean, yeah. considerably, considering. No, but it hasn't. Maybe there. Maybe there will be bloodshed. Yeah. But so far. It's been very interesting. But I don't see how you can take a communist country and make it into a capitalist country. The remodeling of the economy must be impossible. Oh, just, uh, well, you, anyway, you came to Madison. What attracted you to Madison? Well, it was, um, they had a job opening. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> that, uh, that certainly interested me, but also I think the kind of city and uh, I had worked, my, the city manager that I had worked for uh, had gone to the University of Wisconsin when I, when I was referring to him, the Burnsville city manager, mm -hmm. Pat McGinnis, had gone and attended uh, the University of Wisconsin here. So he was, um, he felt very positively about the city and um, said it was a lot like Minneapolis but on a little smaller scale and I was sort of looking for a city that, that, um, that had a university because of the cosmic cosmopolitan nature of, of mm -hmm. that. Uh, uh, it was nice it was a capital city and uh, the size was about right. Mm -hmm. So uh, lo and behold, here I, well, you, we brought, here I came. We brought, you brought a lot of change with you. And uh, maybe yeah. you could talk about your early days in Madison, which weren't all pleasant. Then. That's yeah. right, that's right. Um, started out the, um, the Police and Fire Commission was appointed. It had all been Mayor Dyke appointees and I think uh, Stuart Becker, who has uh, since um, um, died in a number of years after that, but he had always remarked that I sort of uh, came here on the on a one to four, four vote. That it was Tom Stevens, who was president of the commission, uh, wanted me to be the police chief, but the other four didn't. Then Stuart said, "Well, he he thought maybe." It might be a good idea, and then it was a two to three, mm -hmm. and then I guess in the last uh, last minute they got Andy Summers to go along with that, and that became three two. So you were not a unanimous. So I was not a unanimous uh, <laughs> choice, and uh, and I didn't particularly care. I wanted I wanted to come down here, and I wanted to see what kind of job I could do. So I was what, 35 years old then. Mm -hmm. It's a different world. Yeah, it really was. But, uh, I was happy to come down here, but a large percent of, of the department was not too interested yeah. to, to see me, and uh, it meant a lot, of, a lot of changes from 
a pretty rigid paramilitary organization. And when I came down here, it was we wanted to change some of that. And the first I remember the first demonstration that we had. It was uh, it was a China Day demonstration. It must have been just right in January. And um, this is right after you arrived. Yeah, just after I arrived it was in a, a month or so, and I had gone down there and, and met with some of the students about the demonstration and they wanted to know what would happen and said that we're, we're here to to uh, facilitate this. We're not here to stop it and uh, they were a little surprised. They couldn't believe that. They couldn't believe that and, uh, and some of the officers that um, I wanted some officers to come down and, and help with the traffic. And when I saw the cars up, everybody saw a couple of them get their sticks out and everything. Mm -hmm. I said, no, no, we're, we're here to help with the traffic here. We're not, we don't have any problems here. And I ended up, uh, I don't think they knew who I was, a lot of people. And, and uh, so I kind of uh, led it. I walked around the front of the group. We walked over to the Union South. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought, well, that, that's one under my belt. I got one demonstration without any problems. And, and I think, um, you know, we went through most of the 70s. Um, still with a tremendous amount of demonstrations on campus and uh, I suppose we've been through scores of, of them with without uh, any of them uh, blowing up. And so our, I think our strategies of working with, with, the, with the people before, working with the students. Everybody understands. Understanding what, what we're here for, that we're not going to do anything crazy and we would expect them not to. And um, we're facilitators and not people that are trying to block uh, the right of people to peaceably protest. But your department didn't. Uh, some of the well, people. Some, some did. Senior, we were senior officers. That's right. There was some tough, tough times there. Mm -hmm. and, but to the department's credit, we always, we always had enough. I think uh, younger people and a few senior people that um, that were tired of the old ways and they would uh, come and help me because if everybody was against me, I never, I never would have survived. Yeah. And then April came along. And uh, Bill Dyke got defeated in the spring election, and Paul Sutherland got elected. And that was a major thing. I think Paul was very supportive of me and what I was trying to do. And I think it would have been, again, a lot tougher, and, and maybe I couldn't have even survived if, uh, if Bill Dyke had stayed in office and still felt very strongly against me. Yeah, a lot of people who couldn't have survived another term. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, but you were in a, in a critical spot. And um, I remember that you, you were uh, attacked for, was this the first demonstration that you led? Somebody said you carried a candle yeah, and a piece. That's right. They said that I had, uh, charge. in fact, that's one of the better pictures. It was on the front of the state journal and shows me holding a candle. And, uh, and a lot of people really liked that picture and, uh, and it really um, inflamed a lot of the very ultra conservatives in the community that felt that they, we should be beating the heads of the students. Um, the actual facts of that, the, the story is much better about me leading this demonstration, this mm -hmm. peaceful demonstration, but the actual fact was that it was after the demonstration, it was a candlelight parade. We went down to, I think, uh, through the campus and then over on uh, Dayton Street at, um, at a Minority Affairs house that was over there. And then it broke them up, broken up, and uh, things went well. And I was standing around talking with some of my officers, and and uh, some person walked by with this candle in a cup, and they handed it to me and said, "Here for a good demonstration, and thanks." And I just held it there, and then somebody came up and took my picture, and there it was. But that was a uh, to to some a very inflammatory picture, and to others a, a, a very uh, a peaceful setting that um, the things were going to be different. Well, um, when things began to calm down, what has happened to the police department as Madison grows and develops now? Um, well, what has happened, I think over the years we've been able to, to attract, I think, uh, high quality men and women, both of the majority and color, to join the police department. Mm -hmm. And that's really going to be, I think, the, the legacy of the time that I was here, that, that we were able to turn the job around into an important social service job within the community, uh, that people, again, want to be police officers and that people have, who are on the department have some pride in their job, and that there's no 
there's no significant argument about whether or not we're crime fighters or community workers. Mm -hmm. That, for the most part, that overwhelmingly, that officers of the department see themselves as community workers to to help with problems, to to work with people, to work those problems out, and uh, and that the role that they're only a crime fighter, that's their only job, has been, I think, pretty well shoved, pushed aside. And one of the problems is that uh, uh, on television, at the nightly news, you'd think there was nothing but crime in Madison. You hear about murders. Yeah. I remember years ago when nobody got murdered in a whole right. year in Madison. That's right. Now there are a lot of people getting murdered. And it looks as though, it, as though we've yeah. turned into a crime-ridden community. Yeah, I think there's a certain... Um, Emphasis on that, um, you know, crime crime sells. Uh, mm -hmm. We still range from three to five murders a year, which is pretty uh, sleepy time city yeah. uh, compared to across the United States. And when we look at cities around our size, that we seem to be pretty well on that uh, crime data side. But it's um, it, it, it's what um, it's what I guess the the viewers want to see in that. Mm -hmm. Three to five murders is nothing to talk about even. Yeah, this is the our size. What about the gangs? Do we hear well, about? Well, I think one of one of the side, the the downsides of having an integrated city is always the possibility that people will want to come and live here, and they're going to want to bring their kids here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, those kids have had really negative influences that they themselves have been negatively influenced by the by the uh, by gangs predominantly from Chicago and uh, a lot of people want to move out of Chicago and uh, and um, Madison's a nice place to come to it's got a good school system it's got a, a, a good fair housing uh, background to it uh, there's not uh, any ghettos as such within within the city um, but I think still to make a gang gang flourish you've got to have You've got to have the kind of oppressive conditions, um, housing, jobs, education, and that if this city can stay on top of that, to the people are adequately housed and have a a equal opportunity and their children have a chance for a good education, there'll be less chance that the, the drugs and the gang uh, life will be the... In, 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 mm -hmm. in a lot of our larger cities, th there is no alter alternative. In most cases, that's the only alternative. And I think kids still have choices in our community. And what about the people living in the streets? Are there a, a lot of the, the, they, They're from out of town, I gather, from what you say. Well, there's some, there's some network of, 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 of homeless uh, that come in and out of our city. Um, I think we've done a pretty good job from everything that I see and from what my officers tell me of housing people uh, through the churches. Grace Episcopal Church mm -hmm. has taken a major role in that. Uh, there's been some very active community groups to provide shelter and, and, and housing for people. And I think we're taking up, up the slack. There's no, there's no reason, and, and let me not forget to mention the Salvation Army, those, mm -hmm. those caring people all these years that have provided such an important service, that uh, there's no reason for someone not to have shelter who comes to our city, nor not to be able to get food. Mm -hmm. So there are, are uh, people available, and how, how, what do they do when a homeless family arrives here? How do they get in touch with them? They go well, to a church? Just to be well, there's a, there's a communication network, uh, like at the church, through um, Dane County Social Services, uh, through our officers on the street, might find mm -hmm. somebody stranded at a bus depot or some someplace like that. I worked briefly before my husband died. Uh, for a uh, an organization called First Cry for Help, mm. and that was a telephone network that ah. it, uh, accepted calls with the United Way. Sure, um, and it's precisely I think those kinds of community networks that we have mm -hmm. in the city that I a lot of people don't know about that and how important that is in you know providing services and helping people. We don't know uh, much about what if you live in an area like this, even in a smaller city like Madison. You can live your whole life and not be aware. Oh yeah, of what's yeah, going yeah. Out here on the west side, that's right. Mm -hmm. It's pretty comfortable.
How many how many officers are there in the Madison Police Department now? Let's see, we have I think three hundred and six. That's gone up by three times since you came? No, it's it's gone up by it's gone up by about by about eight since I came. Oh. <laughs> and that's just the last two years. We went fifteen years without an increase in the number of police officers in the department. How could that be? Well, we were trying to save money, mm -hmm. and in the last uh, six to eight years, we, we've been pretty sorely tried here, and uh, had um, we've been able to present the information and the evidence to the council that we needed. So there was a, a uh, originally a three-year staffing program where we get 18 additional officers, and now it's going to be probably done in about four years, but we'll, we will go up about to about, uh, I think about 300 or 312 officers, and, and that should hold us for, for a while, but we were pretty short-staffed, and mm -hmm. consequently we're burning up a lot of overtime money because of the extra calls for services and that, because our city, though has only grown about 6% in those 15 years, has really the complexity of things. Uh, things have gotten so much more complex in uh, family violence and uh, and uh, child sexual assault, um, the kind of cases. Um, just the difficulty and the complexity of everything uh, just takes so much more time. Is it more than it used to be, or is it just that the police are doing a much better job? Of well, I think there's a lot more complexity to our society and I think that we are also starting to uncover um, an area that um, that not much attention was paid in the past and that's um, um, intrafamily violence uh, intrafamily sexual assault and working with the kids in the schools has unearthed that so I think those those probably incidents always occurred but were pretty well kept um, kept quiet. Um, uh, we didn't want to deal with that. So we didn't hear that the kids' cries for help as clear as we ought to. Mm -hmm. So that has unearthed uh, and it just... Uh, it tends to, uh, people tend to discount yeah. those stories. Yeah, that's, right, that's right, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I was interested in this new law that requires that the police officer make an arrest and uh, you picked up this 81-year-old lady uh, the other day. Was there? <laughs> She got into the paper. Is that right? For bat battering her husband? Yeah, she slapped her husband and he called the police and they took her in. Well, that's the that's the problem in, in mandating arrests. I've, mm -hmm. um, I've never been a big fan of mandating arrests, yeah. but um, but there are those in the legislature that thinks that that's what we ought to do. Um, and it has. It has caused a lot more arrests. Our, our arrests for... for um, Family violence are probably up about 20, 25 percent uh, just this year, and we were, we we had a pro arrest policy for a great number of years. So even though we had a pro arrest policy, this has driven it even more. Well, uh, I suppose, and then they take them in. Those people are generally discharged, I suppose. Oh yeah, yeah. by you know, they able to bail out, yeah. Now, what about the university and the cooperation between the city and the university? Now, I think people are interested in what's happened. Yeah. Well, there's, there certainly could be a lot more cooperation between uh, the city police department, the sheriff's department, the university, and you know, some suburbs such as Middleton and Monona and Fitchburg and the town of Madison and that. Um, we could do... number of departments. Uh, Shorewood. I can't forget Shorewood. Um, and I think that in the future we're going to have to do some consolidating of a lot of the things that we that are redundant and things like records and records keeping and training and evidence and those things could be could be done better. But there, are, uh, every, everyone sort of wants to have their own police department mm -hmm. in the small small uh, small cities and until. Until larger departments can be more community oriented, um, you know, they're going to opt to go with smaller departments because they feel that they fit their needs better. And I think larger departments have to 
ask why do people feel that way and to try to be a little bit more attentive to community needs. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the stuff that we've done in the last few years of putting officers on foot in, in certain neighborhoods. That's been a very a positive program and uh, I think we have a high degree of customer satisfaction in those areas. People feel safer. Yeah. If they know. What about 911? What has that done to your... Well, I think we're a little, little late. I think 911 would have been great in the 1960s. Um, unfortunately, everybody felt that they wanted it and they were going to feel that they needed it, but um, there's, a, there's a downside to, to 911, and, and that is that uh, you know, it's great for medical kinds of things because they don't have a volume, high volume of calls. Every call that comes into an ambulance or the fire department, they they take it and go because they don't have an excess number of calls. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's many times during during the day, many times during the week, that we have an excess number of calls that we can't service. And yet we can't afford to have the number of police officers on duty that would say to take every call, so we have to delay some calls. And that's when we do that, then that causes some trouble within the 911 system because they like to get the calls out and we, we like to develop or are going to want to develop a lot like we have with our neighborhood officers, sort of a, you know, a medical model. There is, uh, if you have an emergency, you call 911, police emergency, medical emergency. But if you've, uh, if, and, and that's, that's your emergency room physician, but if you have uh, a pain or a problem, you're going to want to talk to your family physician. And we're equating our neighborhood officers to be sort of like family physicians. They'll know the people, be able to work mm -hmm. long-term problems out with them. And uh, both those models, I think, are going to have to exist. We obviously have to provide uh, an immediate service at 2 o'clock in the morning. Somebody breaks the window out and trying to get in your house. We've got to be there immediately. Uh, and that's what 911 for, is for. But we also have to have systems in place so that if there's a noise problem in your neighborhood, um, um, problems with um, maybe kids vandalizing your house, and it's kind of a harassing kind of thing, and you don't know who who it is, but it's really bothering you, then you're going to want to work with a police officer in this area who's going to know the kids and know what's going on and try to spend some time with you, find out what's going on, talk to kids in the neighborhood, all that extra stuff, like a family physician does. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and on the emergency model, uh, they're going to tell you, well, when they cause you problems again, call us and then we'll send somebody out. And then when they do it again, we'll send somebody out. And when they do it again, we'll send somebody out. Whereas our preventative model is, the first time we have this problem, let's work it so we don't, ha don't get the second and the third and the fourth calls. And it's hard to do. So that's going to be a challenge for us in the coming years. I've had them. Um, what about the dope in Madison? Well, it's not, not as bad as larger cities yet. Uh, we'd like to see it a lot better. I think it's it's going to be a major problem, not only not only uh, in this city, but of course nationally. Forever, maybe. Yeah, I think it's and you know there's going to be we sort of targeted the, the the drug dealer over the years, and I think that um, there'll be a lot of a lot of public pressure that. Um, we need to be attending to people who, who use illegal drugs because they are part of the problem. And uh, you know, if, if the middle class and upper middle class starts u using drugs and thinking that, well, that's kind of their little way to, to be cool or something, uh, they're spending a vast amount of money that's, uh, that, that's, that's supporting uh, cocaine babies and overdoses in the ghettos. And I think that, you know, I'm, I'm for putting it that that clear that if you if you buy illegal drugs you're 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 part of the problem you're leading to the deaths and, and deformities of children within our nation's cities because you're supporting um, an illegal operation and about the only way that that that, that changes is somebody says that somehow that the years ago they got some marijuana seeds and they grow their little marijuana plants okay you know then then I think they can maybe make that argument, but I don't know too many people that do that. They're all buying from dealers, and it's an inflated price, and it's just leading to a lot of misery in this country. You just uh, in Madison, are there certain places you're aware where people go to get drugs? 
Well, it's not like we see on the national news, you know, whole blocks of uh, people with uh, coke houses, people coming by, driving up and down the streets and that. Most of the drug connections are made through, uh, through bars. You just go in and ask for... Well, you got to know, know somebody, but if you hang around and that, uh, my people tell me it's pretty, pretty easy to get, get drugs in most bars in Madison that have a you know, high, high volume mm -hmm. bar business. And they know the the word is out which bars those are. Oh, I think people know know what they are, yeah. And that's and that's and that's unfortunate. It's um, what about the dispensing of justice in Madison in Bean County? Is there a long are there long delays or um, is it prompt? No, we don't. Again, we don't. We're not suffering from that. A uh, huge problem of larger cities and, and backups and that. Uh, cases seem to move uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, we've had a history of, uh, of a good uh, judiciary, we'll go all the way back to Jim Doyle when he was mm -hmm. on there too. And he's, uh, so I think there's a good sense of uh, a good judiciary, both in the, in the county court State Supreme Court and the federal bench. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think issues of, I don't hear issues of justice as much as uh, you would in a larger city. In large cities, sometimes you hear about young people that get locked up without being arraigned for months. Oh, or yeah. And, it's in, and what happens is the, you know, the system is in place for a normal volume. And what happens is that the, 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 the volume has gotten such that people can't process people in a humane way, and it's mm -hmm. uh, backlogs and uh, people getting literally lost in the jail system, and or, or else getting set free without anything ever happening. Set, set free, being being assaulted, uh, inhuman conditions within the jails, and that I I think our progressive traditions and sense of fairness and justice in the community are are still pretty well maintained. And the relations with the university are okay. Yeah, much much better. Um, I think that um, as my um, as Stuart Becker said uh, when I uh, took the job here, he said a uh, very important thing you've got to remember in Madison that there's two ends to State Street. Mm -hmm. and one is the sort of the the capital end, and the other is Bascom Hill end. I think so. That's uh, that's good advice, and I certainly try to keep my contacts with um, with faculty and staff that I know mm -hmm. at the university, and uh, and um, so I think that there's there's good good connections there, and they certainly could be be much better. The city and uni university could be doing a lot more more things together, um, but I think uh, think that there's open access between the chancellor's office and and, and my office and. Uh, and uh, athletic department in my office and that I think that people have a sense that they can call on one another and problems start and, uh, and the university and has a has a, a growing police force I gather so. no there must be 50 or, or 60 officers there there now and they can I don't know how long that would continue for someone might I talk about the university being a, a district station from Madison mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any interest in that but at all. You mean uh, really? Uh, you're speaking about um, uh, integrating the two yeah, systems. Yeah, yeah. There is some talk about that. Well, there has been time, but n nothing really serious lately. <laughs> yeah. But throughout Everybody the years. Everybody has too much to do. That's, that's right, that's right, that's right. About it. I think that's a, a large part of it. But a lot of your uh, new officers are university graduates. Oh, right? yes, uh, a large number of them. Some with, some with graduate degrees, and uh, the average age of our class is about 28, so we're getting people that are older, educated, so they've got good job experience, mm -hmm. and they are they are really um, our hope for the future, and that is our, our ability to get uh, get high quality men and women coming on the department, and we seem to be able to do that, where as a lot of other uh, police departments around the country are, are not able to attract people that would want to come and work with them, and that's going to mean some significant uh, changes uh, that we've undertaken, but with, with which most other police departments haven't. You've got to 
to change the uh, the work environment so that it's um, if we're, people are comfortable working there, have a chance to be creative, to to find some um, self-esteem and, uh, and a sense of personal growth. How about salaries? Well, we're we are competitive with other people who are looking for for your mm -hmm. college graduates, and with our incentive program that was started back in 1968, uh, we do pay a premium for people with uh, with um, baccalaureate and graduate degrees. How much do they get? Do well, it's uh, on top of a base salary, a uh, person with a bachelor's degree gets 18% on top of base and 21% for a master's degree. What's the base? It must be around, uh, well, it goes up each year, but I think there were entry, I, I don't know, somewhere in the uh, middle 20s or so. But I think a, I mean, a police officer with a, with a graduate or with a BA degree, after about uh, four to five years, service. Law and order, generally. <laughs> what, what do you foresee? Or, uh, well, I, there was a... There hundred was a, people, a hundred years from now, are going to listen to this, I hope, yeah, hopefully. when they're working on the history of it. Well, I had... Um, I, I think that we're going to get, get away from the authoritarian organizations that have uh, been so much a part of American life uh, for the last hundred years since the turn of the uh, Industrial Revolution. And that we're going to find um, workplaces that are that are highly energizing and satisfying to people, and that um, that police departments and other government departments will be working very closely with the people and considering them to be customers. So rather than talking about crime control, they'll start talking about long-term customer satisfaction, just as if they were running a a business uh, out of the private or the private sector, and that um, that we will be able to use um, technology um, and still you know, have technology work for us, but not at the expense of individual liberties, and that uh, the American police will set the tone for the rest of the world in how how a police department works in a democracy and it's a particular pushes and pulls and checks and balances of right that. now it's, that's coming up isn't that's, it that's right i think so we're going to be really high, sorely tested in many many areas but um, but that police that the police be be considered to be community organizers community workers working with the public out there and working with them to to do not only handle crime, but other senses of community disorder that go on there. Because what we find out now is our neighborhood officers are very good listening posts. They're very good people to find out you know, how trash collection is going on, mm -hmm. how are public health systems uh, going on, and uh, that we're, we also get concerned about uh, um, trash collection, that the street lights that are out, um, uh, potholes in the street, because mm -hmm. we're out there in the community, people feel free to contact us. So I think the role is going to change to sort of the police of the future being social ombudsman mm -hmm. to handle a lot of community problems and, and be the coordinators and the facilitators between other governmental services. Not a number of these countries that are making the big changes. The police have been secret police. Yeah. And the prisoners have been political prisoners. Yeah, and it's going to be a tremendous change for that for them mm -hmm. to to move move into um, using the democratic model. I wish we had in our country right now a better overall model to show mm -hmm. Eastern European countries. They'll be looking. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, they. I suppose the matters of traffic control and um, other sort of auxiliary things. Um, yeah, that take sounds, up a great deal of time in your department. You know, still uh, a lot of a lot of traffic, uh, but but still a tremendous amount of problem solving mm -hmm. and working with people. And that's the gratifying part of the job. Sure.